Well, it is a pleasure to be with you this morning. I, we're, I don't know if we're coming out of troublous times or going into them, but it's good to see you. I wish I could see your faces. I, I'm terrible with names, but I sometimes can remember a face or two of somebody so that if I meet you in Walmart somewhere, I'll know exactly sort of who you are and that I should say hi to you. I wanted to talk with you about uh, the lilies of the field today. And I, I, you know, you get old and you get set in your ways and I really appreciate the chance to come over and preach a few sermons that, uh, that are basically old sermons for me because I don't get to preach them again over where I am. They've all heard them and I'm sure they remember every one. But uh, <laughs> it's good to be with you. I wanted to talk about the lilies of the field, and of course that's in uh, Matthew the uh, 16th, Matthew the 6th chapter, and uh, we're going to read that in verses 19 through 34, which says, see if I can operate two computers at the same time up here, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters, either he'll hate the one and love the other, else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowl of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? Why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And so we begin by asking the question, what's beautiful, what's the glory of the lily? What makes a lily so glorious? Well, first of all, you need to realize that a lily is glorious not because it has certain attributes that we usually associate with glory. The lily is beautiful not because of the richness of its adornment, what it can put on. You know, so many people think that they're beautiful because of the clothes they can put on, because of the car they can drive, because of the house that they live in. You all those of you who've got, had teenage daughters have had this fight at some time or another. You've tried to say to your daughter, you're beautiful just the way you are. You don't have to slather on lipstick. You don't have to bathe in perfume. You don't have to wear the latest style clothes that cost a fortune. You're beautiful just the way you are. 1 Peter 3 and verses 3 through 4 speaks of the godly wife, it says, who's adorning? Let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. But in addition, a lily, you know, is not 
valuable because of what it's worth. Because of what it's worth. It's, you know, so many people associate their value with their money, with how much they make, with how much they have in the bank. Wouldn't it be, you know, somebody said of a millionaire one time that he was worth a million dollars and not one cent more. What a terrible thing. What a terrible thing to be only worth the money that's in your pocket. A lily has nothing. It has nothing and it's beautiful. It's glorious. And I think we should remember that. You know, we look at people so many times and we judge them on the basis of how many dollars they're worth, what they have. But they're beautiful. They're glorious to God just exactly the way they are without a dime. But in addition, a lily, you know, is not beautiful because of its rank. Because of its rank, it just isn't that way. You know, I'll talk to a lot of fellows who, older men who served in the army or the military of one sort or another. And they were kind of frustrated. You know, everybody went from the hometown at one time or another. And they get there and some kid who happened to maybe go to college and get into the officer's training system and served as an officer was bossing them around, and they had to salute him and call him sir. Whereas in their old hometown, it was just, hi, George. It wasn't, he wasn't anything fancy. But suddenly, because he had rank, now I have to show him great respect. Not in this rank. In Luke 7, verse 25, what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in king's courts. You're not beautiful because of your rank, because you're a president or a vice president or an entrepreneur or whatever it is you want to be. That doesn't make you glorious. And we've got to stop thinking like that in our lives. But notice uh, just a little bit further. See if I can get this moving here. Here we go. The lily's glory does not consist in these things. It doesn't consist in its social position. You know, in the small town papers, I doubt if this city's gotten so big you don't see it much, but do you have in the newspaper, if anybody reads the newspaper anymore, a society section where somebody gets their name mentioned or, you know, suddenly their wedding gets a big splash or their retirement, or their achievements in life, get in the paper. It's social position. You know, you can drive through town. And some areas are, oh, well, I wouldn't want to live here, but over here is where the good people live, the expensive people, the expensive homes. A little one beautiful because of its social position. The mink coat that it wears, the fact that it goes out to the fancy restaurants. You know, do you know how many kids want to rent a limo for their graduation? Why? Why are they trying to show off? My daughter, the last day of school, drove a tractor to school. But, <laughs> but anyway, she was a little different. <laughs> and I wouldn't let her rent a limo. But, <laughs> but I had a tractor. So, it's not beautiful because of its social position. As you think about this, let me see where I am here. The lily's glory is glorious because it is natural. Try to convince your daughter of that. By natural, it's free from affectation. You know, these days we all try to stay young forever, don't we? We, dig, we, you know, we get the uplifts and the downlifts and the firm ups and we exercise so that we can all be young forever. Lily was beautiful because of its glorious. You're going to get old. I got old. I lost my hair. I gained some weight. My knees hurt every now and then. Does that make me unglorious? Should you discard old people because they're 
not young anymore. Should I be trying to get transplants and wear a wig and all that sort of thing to make myself look good? I knew, knew a couple of preachers whose hair had gone gray and they decided to go out and dye their hair so they'd look young and go, could go preach more. <laughs> it's free from affectation. It's not trying to pretend to be something it's not. You see young people doing this all the time. They want to associate with uh, musical stars, baseball stars. And so they wear the clothing and look at me. A lily was beautiful just by being a lily. It was beautiful and didn't have to pretend anything. Look at 1 Peter 1, 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. You ever, I don't, I, I preached this sermon one time and there was a fellow who ran a car dealership but anyway, I'm going to make the illustration anyway. If you're going in a car dealership, and you shake the, shake the salesman's hand, and within five seconds of his meeting you, he's calling you by your first name, like your long-lost buddy. Do you really think you're his long-lost buddy? Or is he just pretending? Is he just pretending to be your pal and your friend, and he's going to give you the best deal humanly possible? Come on, all of you check those car prices before you go in there and you know exactly what that thing's worth. <laughs> Why are you pretending? Be what you are. That's beautiful. It's glorious in God's sight. But think with me a little bit further. It's unspotted. The lily is beautiful in that it is unspotted. You know, so many people my wife and I run a little business and we hired young people for a long time to work for us. And it's really sad. It's kind of an entry level position. So many of these young people have loused up their lives before they ever got to us. They've lost their driver's license. They've fathered children. And this has just ruined their lives. They didn't finish their education in high school. What are they going to do? They're going to work cheap their whole life. A lily's beautiful in that it doesn't have those spots on it. Protect yourself. You're beautiful just the way you are. But, you know, a gospel preacher who has ruined his reputation... Everybody who listens to him kind of, he's spotted. There isn't anything glorious about his preaching because he isn't living the life that he's talking about. We need to protect that. A lily was beautiful in that it was unspotted. Again in 1 Peter 1, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain manner of life received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Jesus was without spot. That's why we are here remembering him today. He wasn't just one of us who have spoiled our lives. But I want you to go on just with me just a little bit. The lily would tell you, if you could talk to a lily, and we're going to talk to a lily this morning. If You know, I, every now and then I run across somebody in a church, usually a young woman. And she's, you know, got three kids and her makeup's a mess and her dress is kind of like this and the kids are wallering all over. And when, when did I get here yesterday? Wednesday night. Was it Wednesday night? When was it? Sunday night? Sunday night. One of our ladies has a child, a brilliant child, who happens to be autistic. And he can occasionally be kind of a handful. My goodness. He went on a tear the other night in church, hollering and yelling, and she's dragging him out of the building. And he's screaming and hollering. Oh, yeah, we were having a meeting, and the meeting preacher couldn't 
hardly, you couldn't hardly hear him going, wonder what he's up to back there now. But, and she was terribly embarrassed. And you know, these young women, they say, they look over at some of you older ladies. You're dressed nice, your makeup's good. You've got things sort of in control. And they go, how do you do it? How, how do you manage this? And the answer is the same answer the lily would give. I, honey, I wasn't always this way. <laughs> I had kids too once. And they wallered all over me. And we were dead broke half the time. And it was a real struggle. A lily, when you see it blooming and beautiful, wasn't always this way. There was a time when it was just in the ground. It was just beginning to think about being that lily that you're so familiar with. Here, I've got to get back to where I am. Too many. You might look with me at uh, Mark 4, verse 26. So is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up. He knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. When the fruit is brought forth immediately, he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come. Now one of these days, ladies, some young woman is going to walk up to you and say, how do you do it? And you're going to be amazed because you weren't all this way either. You weren't always this way. And you young men, one of these days, if you'll behave yourself, You'll grow up, you'll be struggling for a job, you'll be struggling everywhere you can go, trying to make way for the family, trying to discipline those kids, trying to help your wife, trying to keep the house from falling down around your ears. But one of these days, somebody's going to come up and tap you on the shoulder and say, listen, we need some deacons here at the church. We need an elder here. Would you consider it? And you're going to go, me? me? The answer was you weren't always what you are now. You've improved. You've aged. You've conquered some of the fights. You grew just like a lily grows. But in addition, there it is in the root. There it is bringing up the blade. He says, first the blade, then the ear. After that, the full corn in the ear. When the fruit is brought forth immediately, he putteth, putteth in the sickle because the harvest is come. But in addition, the lily would say to you quite clearly, I didn't get this way by myself. You know, you think, I can do it. I can pull myself up by the bootstraps and I can accomplish but you had a lot of help. <laughs> we all did. We had parents that helped us. We had brothers and sisters that helped us. We had friends that helped us. Just like a lily did. The lily would take in the, all that it can from the birds, the bees. It can take all of it can from the rain, from the sunshine, from the storms, all of those. And lo and behold, after it's taken in all of this, it grows and it's beautiful. You're going to go through the same thing. And you're going to have help along the way. It's not going to happen just overnight. In Galatians 2, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Not yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You didn't get this way by yourself, did you? The Lord's been guiding you all along, along with all those other people that helped you. Ah, another thing. Do you realize the lily never once worried about growing. You know, we spend an inordinate amount of time. I've gotten to work. You know, I thought I would get over this as I got older, but it's worse. I wake up about four every morning and immediately begin to worry. 
planning something, doing something, hoping something doesn't go wrong, thinking in my mind about how to fix things and go over them and over them and over them until I'd say, hey, John, you're being stupid. You can't fix it tonight. And it'll be there tomorrow and the next day too, probably. Or maybe, better yet, you can get your kids to fix it. <laughs> Lily never once worried about growing. Never once said, ooh, I wonder if I'm going to ever manage to bloom and grow and be, be uh, everything I wanted to be. You know, in Philippians 4, the Lord tells us, be careful for nothing. That's in the King James. Be ye anxious for nothing, other versions say. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Don't worry about it. That's what the Lord's telling you. The lily doesn't worry about it. Not for a minute. Doesn't worry about where the next rain's going to come. Doesn't worry about whether we're going to get enough nutrition from the soil. Doesn't worry about whether the sun's going to shine. Never worries. The Lord said, consider the lilies, how they grow. And you might think about that for yourself. Do what you've got to do to be who you are today. The lily not, not worrying about next week. The lily's not worrying about what happened a week ago. We're just doing what we can today. Sufficient unto the day, the Lord says, is the evil thereof. But in addition, <laughs> I like this point. Every now and then you see somebody who says, I, you know, we, <laughs> we, uh, we sing songs about this that are kind of goofy. But the, the idea is, I'm determined. You ever try to go to sleep? You ever have trouble going to sleep? And you go to, you lay down at night and you say, I'm going to sleep tonight. Did that work for you? <laughs> probably not. No, probably not. You can't, you can't worry yourself, determine yourself, force yourself to grow or to go to sleep, or to do a whole lot of anything. Do you know how you do it? Well, there it is. You get your mind off of everything. Maybe you count sheep, and by the time you get to number 45, all the stuff's gone out of your mind. You're trying to remember 46, if you can, and you fall asleep. It's the law of indirection. A young woman came to a doctor one time and said, I can't stand my husband. I can't stand him. He never compliments me about anything. He's never nice to me. He never smiles. He's never good. I'm going to divorce him. And the doctor said, huh. He said, why don't you try this? Try this for one month and then come back and talk to me. She said, what? He said, well, for one month, you fix every meal he likes. For one month, you dress the way he likes. For one month, you don't fuss at him or nag him. You just brag on him and build him up. And then you come back and tell me whether you got a problem. Well, she didn't come back the next month. After a couple of months, she finally came back in for a regular checkup. And he said, what about the problem with your husband? She said, I don't know what it was. But suddenly, my husband, he, he became a different man. What was it? She kept trying so hard to make him different and just concentrated on doing her job as a wife. And he changed. It's the law of indirection. We worry so, we determine we're going to make this. And sometimes the idea is just to go a different way. Okay, <laughs> where's, I had, where's this thing? My wife and I, when we were first married, we decided to go out and invest in a home. And this is it. We had about, I think about 14 acres. If you'd smoothed it out, it was some of that Kentucky real estate. If you'd smoothed it out, it probably would have been 40 acres, but it was on the side of a hill, which you can see there. It was a 100-year-old long cabin, which didn't have running water. 
we built that. That outdoor toilet was something my wife just was drawing the line at. It was a little chilly. It wasn't too older, though. You could have company. <laughs> a good friend in the church helped me an awful lot as a young man. But, you know, there were <laughs> there's some things about this. Let me see. I was going to point. I think this works as a pointer. Right there, we had a window. And outside that window, somebody who lived there before us, some man who was 100 years old, a guy who lived there originally, had raised seven kids in a two-room log cabin. And uh, it's still there, by the way. Outside the window was an enormous oak tree. Right there. That isn't as big as it was. It was bigger. And outside of our window, we'd sit there and we'd play park cheesy at night. We'd have our dinner and look out the window. Outside the window was a patch of daylilies. Daylilies. And they were beautiful. They'd bloom. And every now and then, the wife would go out and she'd cut off two or three of them and put them in a little vase and put them on our little table to grace our dinners and parcheesi games. Now let me ask you something. Can you imagine the daylilies in that patch saying, hey, what's wrong with me? Why didn't she pick me? I should be able to be cut off and taken in the house and be admired. What, what, what was different about this other day, Lily, than me? Being jealous about it. Or a day, Lily, saying, I'm tired of being a day, Lily. I'm just sick and tired of that. Look at that big oak tree down there. Everybody who drives up and down that road, there was a road out there. Everybody who drives up and down that road admires that monstrous oak tree. I'm sick of being a day, Lily. I want to be an oak. Isn't that stupid? <laughs> Can you imagine the day lily being that dumb? But we are. We are. Now, in case you think I'm lying about it, that was a painting somebody made for me. That was the actual house in the snow back up there. We did live in there for several years. The lily was submissive to God's will. Submissive to God's will. And that's important to understand. If you didn't care, cut the day lily and bring it off and admire it, it was still beautiful. It was still glorious. And it's still happy to be a lily. And the lily's not jealous. And saying, oh, I wish God had made me an oak tree. If I could only be an oak tree. But you know Christians are like this. We're jealous of somebody else's life. Someone else who gets admired. Somebody else who's popular while we're not. And we get jealous of who we're married to and our situation in life. And we say, oh, I wish I had been born. I wish I had done this. I wish you had done that. Instead of just being content with who we are. I'm going to read you a little poetry. This is, I've got to find my place here because I can't see all my notes up here. Yeah, this is Thomas Gray's Elegy in a Country Churchyard. And you'll be happy to know I'm not going to read you the whole poem. But part of it says that he was, that in this courtyard, graveyard, Perhaps there's some village Hampton that with dauntless breast the little tyrant of his fields had stood. Some mute, inglorious Milton here may rest. Some Cromwell, guiltless of his country's blood. The applause of listening senates to command. The threats of pain and ruin to despise. To scatter plenty o'er a smiling land and read their history in a nation's eye. Somebody in that little country churchyard could have been like that. Far from the matting crowds in noble strife, their sober wishes never learn to stray. Along the cool, sequestered veil of life, they kept the noiseless tenor of their way. 
Full many a gem of purest ray serene, the dark, unfathomed caves of ocean bear. Full many a flower is born to blush unseen and waste its sweetness on the desert air. Maybe that's you. You're not a star. You weren't a great athlete. You're not a millionaire. You're just you. You think you're not beautiful because of that? The lily was happy being a lily. No matter what. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 14. The body is not one member but many. If the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God said the members, every one of in them in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? And now are they many members? Yet but one body. And one other passage in Philippians 4. Not that I speak in respect of one. For I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Obviously I'm going to need to hurry. <laughs> we'll get there sooner or later. In addition, you know so many people are waiting for a miracle. They're going to hit the lottery. They're going, they're going to get lucky one day. The law of appropriation. The lily wasn't waiting for a miracle. It just took what it could every day. It took its share of the rain and the wind and the sun and the dew. I'm going to have to catch up here. <laughs> it's terrible to get in such a habit of things that you can't adapt. Look in 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians 12 where Paul had that thing the thorn in the flesh and God said my grace is sufficient for thee for my strength is made perfect in weakness most gladly therefore will I rather glory and in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Do you believe that passage? That the lily lives that way. The Lord was trying to tell you. In Acts 20 and verse 35, I've showed you all things, how that's so laboring. You ought to support the weak, to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, that how he said it's more blessed to give than receive. The lily wasn't holding back anything. Oh, we do that so much. We don't want to open up. We don't want to be open with people. The lily's open. You're allowed to see its beauty. It wasn't holding back to the birds and the bees and anything, the butterflies. It wasn't holding back. It would share. We need to learn to do that. And finally, it did all of that, all of that for a day, for a day. James 1, the rich in that he's made low because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass. And the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth so shall also the rich man fade away in his ways. I got to preach at my grandmother's funeral. And I told them about the wonderful life she lived in a small community in Mississippi. Fat cattle grazing out in front of her house. And now that world was gone. It was gone. The world was a different place. Are you seeing the same thing? You're looking back into, I'm looking back into the 50s and 60s. I don't know how far you look back. And the grace of the fashion of it is dying. You've lived just for a day. 
Are you willing to do that? 1 Peter 1 and verse 24, all flesh is as grass. All the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. Consider the lilies of the field. They toil not, neither do they spin. Thank you for listening.